Can you hear me? Can you guys hear us? Oh, I'm working. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Nice work. Have my feet up. Oh, okay, you're fine then. Rent your car and sleep. Can you guys hear Levi? That was actually my original plan. Yeah. Just stay for two days. Okay. Do you like this setup like this? It's excellent. If you okay, perfect. Safe place Thank you, Jenna. That wouldn't actually be bad. Okay. Yeah, safe place. Donuts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can guess that we are waiting, waiting, one more person. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hey, Daniel? Yeah. I don't heard anything from you. What do you mean? You're supposed to meet yesterday, right? Oh. I emailed you yesterday. Nice. You don't need to reply my email. Yeah, fancy, right? Yeah. I turned oh, it gosh. sideways. Yeah. Oh, I guess Ooh. I haven't seen it. Um, you did not see it? I didn't see it. Probably. You did not check the email for two days? I do. I check it like once a week. Are you like, once a week? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm really bad with that stuff. Um, Where did I put my sister? So, tomorrow? Yes, no excuse. Yeah, I was just busy last week. She'll be out of cargo next week. Huh? She'll be out of cargo next week. She'll be out of cargo. Yeah, that's true. Oh, this is a bummer. And then I check in the morning and whenever it beeps oh. that. I think it is, it's fine to start. Okay. I was gonna bring the paper with me because I wrote notes on it, but <laughs> I left it at my Can you get a couple? place. Oh yeah. Which one is the one that I that I use? Is it this one? Yes. Okay. Alright, so I finally decided to go back and try and actually like uh figure out why I was doing my research in the first place. So uh, I just did uh, some research on like uh, cadmium sulfide quantum dots that are capped with thiol ligands. Um, the paper that I'm reviewing, which is this paper, um, is a review paper. So I'm like reviewing a review paper. And yes, I know it is eight years old. Don't judge me. <laughs> Um, but this is like the paper that relates most to what I'm like doing research on, and also it like references our collaborators multiple times in our in that paper. So like that was pretty neat. So I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go with it. So, anyways, that is the paper that I'm looking at right <coughs> now. Okay, so the first thing that I needed to figure out, which I didn't know until this week, was that there was like different types of core shell quantum dots. Um, so the chemium sulfide quantum dot is a type 1 quantum dot where the um, outside, so the uh, valence band and the conduction band of the shell is higher and lower than the valence band and conduction band of the chemium sulfide core. Which means that the core doesn't really influence too much about the um, like chemistry of the uh, doesn't influence the chemistry of the uh, surface that much. Um, so it can basically be considered a cadmium sulfide quantum dot because it's possibly the same thing, which is why when I did my research on it, I didn't put a cadmium sulfide core in there because there wasn't really a need for it because it had the same chemical properties as just a regular uh, cadmium sulfide quantum dot. Um, yeah, so these are the different types uh, which you know, I didn't know about until like very recently. So, anyways, uh, this is this is what we're looking at here. And then um, there are different types of synthesis. I cannot go into much detail about it. I looked into it for like four hours, and I still don't understand anything. But I know a little bit. <laughs> um, so there's like a co-injection method uh, where you use the uh, thiol ligands as a precursor, which gives a cadmium sulfide quantum dot, the sulfur of it. Um, so basically it dissociates the top of the um, thiol, which I'll show a picture of in case you don't know what thiol looks like. Um, 
and the sulfur is donated to the quantum dot. So you put a certain amount of cadmium in there and then um, the, the sulfur comes from the thiol, which makes it a very stoichiometric structure. So there's no like cadmium enrichment or anything like that uh, because it's very like one-to-one -one ratio. Otherwise the sulfur won't deprotonate. Um, not deprotonate, but it won't dissociate from the molecule. Um, and then it also allows for excess uh, thiol to be present on the surface uh, from the get-go. Uh, otherwise, you have to do some sort of exchange, which I cannot tell you much about at all, but I read about it. Um, so, anyways, uh, if you have excess thiol in the solution before it's scary, and you make a quantum dot from using the sulfur from the thiol, uh, and you have leftover like thiol, then it just happens to be on the surface of the quantum dot once the the ratio is met between the cadmium and the sulfur. Um, and then there's this one, which is, uh, I think it's pronounced SILAR if for, for the, the acronym. Um, but basically, it's just adding different layers uh, at a time. So like one layer at a time of the cadmium and sulfur. So then you just stack them, um, which is, they're both relatively simple to do, well, simple. Um, but they're both relatively the same to do, uh, produce kind of the same results. Uh, but we're looking more into like this kind of method rather than this method uh, because no thiol is present. Um, and all of the, like it's like passivated completely by the oleic acid and amines. Um, so in order to put any thiol on the surface, you'd have to switch stuff. And I don't know how that works. So please don't ask me about that. Um, but yeah, so there's no thiol present initially. Um, and then amine is known to deprotonate oleic acid, so uh, then the surface has a negative charge from the oleic acid and needs to be balanced out with enriched cadmium, uh, which I feel like is not that great for like a simple system that we were kind of looking at before. So if you're going to do this kind, it's probably going to have some cadmium, some extra cadmium on the surface due to the, to the oleic acid being there. Okay, and in the paper, I specifically fo fo focus on thiols, um, but there's different uh, ligands that are present. I wasn't expecting you guys to be so quiet. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, there's different ligands that they talked about. They talked about uh, topo, which I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that, um, which is insoluble in a polar solvent, which is uh, like if you want any sort of biological applications that doesn't work out well. Um, so that's why we're kind of looking at thiol, because thiol is soluble. Um, and then, uh, it's, it's kind of pronounced, but can you provide the chemical structure for topa? Oh, no, not off the top of my head. I could definitely look it up, but I don't have it here. Um, I actually did have it here, but I left my paper. Can you reconstruct it based on the naming? No. Paskin <laughs> oxide? I mean... Um, no, I haven't gotten to that point in chemistry. Do you remember the structure of DNA? Uh, roughly, yeah. I mean... So it has bases, it has sugar, right? Yeah. And it has the phosphate groups. Okay. So you remember how this phosphate group looks like? Um. No? I think I do, but like, it's been a while since I looked at it. So I couldn't, I couldn't do it off the top. I know who can help you, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it has a central boss. Uh, can you maybe use a drawing? Thank you. Kind of Here, we have a little way for it. Oh, or oh, oh, in the board, yeah. So then you can just show it to everyone. Okay. So. We're doing the topa or the phosphate? Well, let's do topa, uh, and then we, I guess, then this would be clear where the phosphate so, goes. So for topa, it would have a central phosphate group, and then we would have double bond with oxygen, correct? And then I got a thumbs up in the back. So <laughs> and then we would have. And this. TO stays for tree, I guess, the, how, how it's in the Greek or Latin. Try. Try, try, I'll. And O stays for the, I think, octa or something like this, which also comes from the Greek, eight. 
Yes. How do we know? We have um, three oct Same as three octal groups. Actils, actils, actils. How we pronounce it? So yeah, C eight H H seventeen. Well, right. I wrote it as C H two times right. seven. But there are CH3. eight carbons in the chain. So yes. Yeah, I would not have gotten there. And and in in DNA they don't have, of course, this uh, uh, carbon-based groups. It's just uh, oxygens, right? So I mean, yeah, I've seen it a million times, but I've never like had to. Oh, pay attention to next time. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. And it's again, it's attached to the quantum dot through the oxygen, right? Yeah. I did not look into it very much. I've just seen... It's attached to the oxygen, and these chains are mainly needed for the solubility properties, to increase the solubility in a... Well, in which solvent this will be... Uh, this this uh, this molecule will be dissolved? Non-polar? Yeah. Okay. Mainly kind of not very polar organic solvents would work. Okay. Sweet. Be done, right? Thank you. Yeah, I was gonna put a picture and I didn't, I'm really regretting it. Um, anyways, it decomposes at high temperatures, which is also not great for any sort of biological applications. And then it also is toxic. Um, I could not tell you why, but in all of the reports, that's what it said. Are they toxic? Are they really toxic? They're like not supposed, when it was, when I was reading the article, I was like, do not put any sort of any biological applications because they are harmful. So, <laughs> it's probably not eatable for sure, but I, mean, I would not call these groups toxic. Okay. Well, again, comparing to cat selenium, <laughs> yeah. structures, and nothing is as toxic as the quantum dot, but okay. <laughs> um, and then it talked a little bit about amine, uh, which they had some benefits to it. It creates a stable quantum dot. Um, and it also increases emission, not significantly, uh, but it does um, in some way. And then also carboxylic acid, which is what I'm going to be working on in the future, um, has the same kind of properties to it, but neither of these um, have the same benefits as thiol as far as the increase in um, emission. Or, yeah. And then this is, I just wanted to show, okay, well you can't really see it, it's in the corner of the that's what I use to represent um, the thiol groups, but there's a bunch of different types of thiols that you can use. Um, they talk about a few different kinds um, in the paper, which I am not 100% familiar with, uh, but I will talk about the like using a different one at the end. Um, but I just use this because, um, or like the methyl thiol, is that how you say it? Methyl thiol? I know it's meth something. Anyways. Um, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, do you have a picture of all of these components together at some point or not? Oh, I didn't put that on there. I do definitely have one. I just don't have it on here. Just... Okay, so you have your quantum dot, right? And your quantum uh -huh. dot and the shell both are cadmium selenium. True? Is that true? No. 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 So the, it's, the core would be cadmium selenium and then the shell would be cadmium sulfur, but I just use cadmium sulfur. We have so cadmium sulfur for the shell. Uh -huh. And then you have the thiol and the amine both connected to the outside of that. Yeah. And then the topo dissolving all of this, right? Oh, okay. Well, I, I, I haven't worked with topo at all. Usually you, oh. you're not using all ligands. You use either topo or either amines, right? Or okay. carboxylic groups. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's a mixture, but typically People try to kind of you know simplify the the ligands and uh, not not working in a mixture very much. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So uh, in this case, you're going to be using thiol and amine. You won't be using topo. Okay, well that's what I did for my research, but this is for the paper that is like a review paper. So like that's that's what I did for my research, but not what's listed here. So this is basically it's a review paper. So it's a review of a whole bunch of different experiments. So I'm just kind of doing a general knowledge type thing for my benefit and for other people's. So that was kind of my plan of action. Um, anyway, so I use the thiol with a methyl group on top uh, rather than a huge long chain because it's unnecessary and doesn't react with the quantum dot itself um, that I know of specifically except for one instance, which I'll talk about later.
Uh-huh. Okay, so why would we use thiol? Uh, a positive of thiol is that the ligands help reduce trap states, uh, which are on the surface of the quantum dot, so it just donates um, I'm fairly certain, I don't know exactly the chemistry behind it, uh, but it donates protons to those trap states so that uh, electrons, not protons, it donates electrons to the trap states so it's less li likely that an electron will fall into that trap state so it would re reduce blinking uh, and increase emission. Um, and then small concentrations of thiol can significantly in increase the photoluminescence, which is uh, somewhat equivalent to my first statement. And then uh, the negatives are the low concentrations of thiol, which would produce the best uh, photoluminescence as far as the long stability, like long-term results, uh, like on a matter of days rather than hours. Um, it takes a long time to kind of like see the effects of the thiol. Um, and with large concentrations, it obviously is like a fast decay, so it doesn't, it's not really stable in, in the larger concentration side of it. And I have a, uh, a graph of that later. And then also in different pHs, uh, it can deprotonate and defilate, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Okay, so thiol loses its proton to create thiolate. I know that most of you guys know that. Um, but in this case, uh, thiolate is both responsible for the increase and the decrease of photoluminescence, which is why we're kind of looking at it, trying to figure out whether or not thiolate can um, we can like stabilize it, create a mixture between thiol and thiolate to result in like an overall bright quantum dot. Um, so like a couple of studies, I would say many, um, have shown that thiol is not responsible for the photoluminescent change, it's rather thiolate. Um, and so it reduces the trap states, um, but at high concentrations, thiolate creates its own trap states. So it's like a give and take, so you don't want if you have too much thiol on the surface, you're going to have too much thiolate. But if you don't have enough thiol, then you're not going to have enough thiolate. Um, and when you have thiol on the surface and you don't allow it to deprotonate at all, nothing changes about the quantum dot. Um, and so there's no necessarily like perks to it. So. Okay, and this is the graph. I really like this graph. It's a pretty old graph. It's from 2005. Uh, but I still think that it has... Uh, relevance. So um, this is from our experimentalist. Um, so the BME is this, and I don't know the chemical structure of that, um, but that's what it stands for. Um, and it's just basically the concentration of thiol uh, over like like how much it, it is and over um, hours. So you can see that without it, the quantum dot, like without any sort of um, Thiol on the surface, the quantum dot is pretty stable and uh, like has a decent quantum yield over you know 100 hours. And then with uh, like a small amount, you can see it, it goes up, it like increases significantly. Um, and I can't really tell the difference between these two colors, so I don't know which one is which. Um, I'm assuming that this one is this one. So your black one having zero milliliters for your BME ligand, mm -hmm. right? So first of all, we don't know to what is B BME. Second, then it's not a bare dot. It should have other ligands. And what are the other ligands in this case? Um, you said that this data taken, like, again, this is a problem with the review paper. If you go with presenting review paper, you have to go through the citations, especially if you go into the results, especially if you show in the really data, right? Mm -hmm. You need to understand and you need to explain and be able to really represent the science. Right now, you're just saying, well, some molecule in some concentrations, too much general kind of ideas without really support. So what exactly is the synthesis for this case? In addition, that they change the concentration. In which solution? What other ligands are present? Um, I know this, but I don't want to give wrong I Do you have your paper with you somewhere? I, I, it should I be had, in the paper, right? Yeah, I had all of it and I left it. In your office? Yes. <laughs> I know. I like got here and I was like, yeah, anyway. It is, is it cadmium selenide zinc sulfide particle? What? Cadmium selenide zinc sulfide. Zinc sulfide? What? Zinc. Zinc sulfide. Well, no, no, the structure of the quantum dot. But if they're not using the ligands, they still should have ligands on the surface. Then 
Can I ask a quick question? Uh -huh. So, how come zero concentration of um, beta mercaptoethanol actually changes uh, over time the quantum yield? What makes it change if you don't add anything additional to the system? I think just over time the quantum dot degrades. Uh, ah. Okay. Yeah. So this is degradation in that short period of time, a hundred hours. I, I believe so. Yeah. The, this is. Why I don't think the quantum dot degrades. The quantum dot probably stays there. So the chemistry on the surface is changing. You create entrapped states, and it becomes not luminescent. Anymore. <clears throat> it's a quantum yield change. It's not showing anything about really physical degradation of the system. The quantum dots are very stable structures. They not degrade just because you wait for hundred hours, right? So it's it's changing the quantum yield. So it means something happening with the ligands on the surface. There is a chemical reaction. Maybe they disattached, maybe they deprotonated, maybe they react with something else in the solvent, who knows? But something happens during this time so that the quantum yield decreases, probably due to the presence, like more trapped states appearing after, I don't know, 10 hours, right? You really, maybe because the ligands disattaching from the surface. Mm -hmm. There are some dynamical processes. And again, this plot, of course, not answering the question why and what. It just. Right. Uh, Matter of fact, that in all cases, even in a case when you have whatever your beneficial concentration for having some quantum yield increased from 30 to 50 or to 60, right, twice increased comparing to the zero concentration, the black line, it's not really staying constantly, constantly, how say, yeah. So, so I think it's, they call it photo bleaching or 
well, you can call it photodegradation, technically, right? So it means degradation in the sense that optical properties degradate. The system by itself stays, of course, as it is. I don't think that your quantum dot just <laughs> becoming a <laughs> becoming not a quantum dot after that. Right. It's a chemistry on the, it's a chemistry on the surface is changing, mm -hmm. and it's okay. a really very interesting question to answer why, and that's why. Actually, you are doing research yeah, that's... mainly to answer the question. Not, not, not because styles really provide the superior properties. They may be not, but as well, they have some potentials, right? Mm -hmm. It's showing some potentials, but it also having this problem with reduced quantum yield. So knowing the mechanism, understanding what's really going on helps us to first explain this behavior, and maybe then we can find a way to fix it. So it will be not degrading after uh, if, if we can treat it accurately or can control it accurately. Yeah. Okay. I have nothing more to add to that. Um, but that, that's like the reason that I was starting to do my research on it. Um, was because it showed some sort of progress with an increase in the quantum yield from dial. So, yeah. But clearly too much of it doesn't help anything and immediately not immediately, but over time, makes it have no quantum yield at all. So, <clears throat> okay. Um, then there's a, a small step that I have only worked with cadmium sulfide, so I do not know anything about any other quantum dots um, that aren't cadmium based. Uh, but it threw in there something about how the um, the, uh, sorry, I'm thinking. Uh, a quantum dot, like a, an IMP quantum dot, uh, capped with topo has less than 1% efficiency, but then capped with thiol has 30% efficiency. And um, there was a study I didn't, of course, I didn't. Is it also from this uh, review paper? This yeah, it was just a, a small paragraph at the end, which is, I think. And again, they, they refer to some uh, original uh, work, right? Yeah, they do. And I had. I like it. No, never mind. Um, yeah, but I looked at that paper and that was significantly older. So I was gonna go and like look through all of the different types of papers, but they're just very hard to find. Not find, but just like read. So. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that's why the rule is not to use the review papers for this type of presentations, because instead of one paper, then you have to compare <laughs> thousand papers which were cited already. Right, to answer all these questions if people start asking you questions. Because in a review paper, this is really done just statements. Yeah. But the main question for, for, for research for scientific papers is not really just the statement, we need to prove it, or we need to see the proof. Like I would say, you have the statements and there should be a graph same as it was in your previous slide with some experimental data showing that, yeah, look, emission is increased by 30%. Here is a peak growth, here is a peak goes down, or something like this, right? But, 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 but it's, not like it's, it's a problem with the review paper. <laughs> yeah. So be careful. <laughs> For this type of presentations, it's not really the best choice, but okay. Um, well, anyways, my review of the paper itself uh, it's a pretty good paper, but there's some like inconsistencies uh, with like what it's talking about because it'll be trying to make a point and then it'll jump around um, and they won't like finish what it's trying to say. Um, so I had to do like a lot of digging, but all in all, if you're trying to learn about any sort of like how like capping of quantum dots works, uh, this is a really good paper to look at. Uh, and it like it talks a lot about like. How, like um, the benefits and the like not benefits of capping it like of capping a quantum dot the different kinds of quantum dots not only cadmium sulfur because that's more of a new not not new but like uh, it's kind of starting to be used more than uh, but a lot of papers are focused on cadmium selenide so um, anyways uh, and then it has a lot of information about surfactant, I don't have, know how to say that, but exchange, uh, which I knew nothing about. But if you're interested, it does have an entire, like, the entire second half of the paper is about that. So if you want to learn about that, that's a great place to go. Um, so there was a statement made, and I was hoping somebody could, could
could clarify it, and I really wish I had brought my paper because I was going to read the sentence that it was on. Um, but it was talking about how the uh, difference between monodentate and bidentate thiols. Um, and I looked it up, and bidentate has two sulfurs on it, which they're just connected uh, with a carbon. So there's a carbon and two sulfurs. Then it's with a thiol, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So like, I don't understand what... Brendan, am I right? We call thiol which has just one sulfur. Right, yeah. Is there a two sulfur? How you call this compound? Like carbon um, and two sulfur attached. Uh, Levi also should I, know. I think it's a, a bicarbon, no. It was the stuff, it was the title that we used with Andrea, uh, bicarbonate, I think. Okay, well then I'll look that up because that did not make any sense to me. So anyways, that was something that was uh, inconsistent through the paper. And, um, so in other words, you find the type of, in a, in I a, think in, so. In, a, in this paper, right? I, so well, like, technically they should not really use this language. Yeah. It was very confusing. Um, and then they just like ended the paragraph after that. So I was like, all right, I don't know what's happening. Um, but I thought that maybe someone would know, but no one looked at it. So, um, and then I just have one. So this is the paper uh, that talks about um, this ligand being passivated on the surface. Again, I don't have any of the specific information on it, um, which, you know, second thought I definitely should have. Um, but, so, uh, a preformed chamium selenium um, quantum dot, which is not particle, I just put that, um, was introduced to thiol, and like this particular type of thiol, uh, and a single thiol, this kind of thiol, quenched emission by 50%, uh, which was very confusing to me because why would they, why would that happen? Um, but this is the explanation that they gave for it was uh, photooxidation of the ligand occurred creating disulfides resulting in photoinstability. So if anybody can help me out figure this out, that's a paper I don't understand it at all. So yeah, anyways. That's the well, this, this is just saying photooxidation of the ligand is saying that you have the thiols creating disulfides and disulfides is actually a sulfur-sulfur bond. Okay. So. so is it actually removing some of the surfactants by turning them into disulfides and then the sulfur is acting interacting with another sulfur and therefore cannot interact with the quantum dot? Yeah, I guess again, it's a process is what happens on the surface, so you're losing your ligands, right? Right. And, they, and that's again, of course, creates trap states and probably results in a quenching. Okay. So some chemical reaction is happening there. So why would the loss of a ligand be detrimental when a quantum dot just in a singular solvent can be. Do we, have, do we have dangling bonds? What is a dangling bond? I'm assuming just a not saturated bond. Okay, not saturated bond. If you lose ligand, right? So what happens with a bond where it was attached to cadmium? It's, it's having this non saturated bond. Pretty mm -hmm. much the same. It's not as strong as if you see in organic, like when you have radicals. Okay. Take benzene ring, disattach hydrogen, you will get a radical, whatever is the name of this radical. It's extremely reactive, its properties very different from a regular benzene, benzene molecule because of this dangling bond, not saturated bond, right? Mm -hmm. So pretty much the same story with a quantum dot. You have in, uh, the difference is of course because it's a different nature of the bond, it's coordinated bond rather than covalent, like pure, pure chemical covalent bond in carbon, 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 hydrogen kind of type of bonds. But you have cadmiums which are in a bulk structure, wants, would like to have four neighbors, right? So they are four coordinated cadmiums. On the surface, if you not have in ligands, you, you might have only three neighbors, you might have two neighbors, you might have only one neighbor, which would be making this cadmium extremely reactive, right? So that's why it will react with everything which is surrounding if there are ligands, whatever, solvents, oxygen, or something to saturate these bonds, right? And if you're not controlling it, some, some ligands like oxidation process processes usually not, not, not doing good things with uh, uh, optical properties, right? So same as you saw with your silate. Like if you have a silate, you have the, like your, lowest, uh, your lowest transition is really associated with this uh, orbitals just sitting on the sides, not dealing with the quantum dot at all. Of course, they're not luminescent. Of course, you're losing your luminescence. If you just 
just lose proton from the cells and you have many cells on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. I was very confused, so. So in your structures, when you work with this small cat 3 selenium 3 or cat 3 sulfide 3 and we don't put ligands on the surface, right? We optimize and we still, if you look on the absorption spectra, the low states are optically bright, optically active, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, and oh, why it's optically active? Why are we not seeing a quenching? Well, because of the reconstruction of a surface. Again, if you look on your structure, you can see how much it changed change compared to the bulk. So you have really change, and like your cadmiums on the surface is really different the bond lengths, cadmium selenium or cadmium sulfide bonds on the surface becoming longer, comparing and, and they shortening in a core and they longening, in, uh, elongating in a, in a shell. Mm -hmm. So this surface reconstruction change in the geometry kind of compensate for these dangling bonds. Okay. They kind of heal themselves. That makes sense. Right? <coughs> However, it's a very rigid structures. If you so we were taking really, really one nanometer quantum dots, you have just one like you know number of atoms, like the size is so small that they can really move. Now if you put several layers, like you start with this, then you put layer of of cat selenium here, then another layer and like three, four nanometer quantum dots, right? Of course the surface becomes much more rigid. It cannot, like your core is heavier now, right? It cannot change the length of the bond lengths in the core as easy as if you have just 12 or how many atoms in your structures, in the, in the one nanometer structures. You will have now thousands atoms in the core and, and even more on the, on, the, on the surface, right? <laughs> so then if you go to real size quantum dots, the surface reconstruction cannot take place as efficiently as it does in a small quantum dots. So small quantum dots behave more like molecules in other words, right? And molecules can adjust their structures very easily. The bulk solid materials, of course, much more rigid, and they cannot make these ge changes in the geometry as easy. So that's why one nanometer quantum dot have this self-healing properties, while two, three nanometers will be not able to to solve this problem with the dangling bonds. And that's why loss of a ligand from from bigger quantum dots will have much more serious effect comparing to your structures, which you which you model, right, with this one nanometer yeah. structures. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. But in both cases, the source is dangling bonds, right, not saturated bonds. Mm -hmm. And the question is how you saturate them. Um, if you saturate it kind of in the right way, then your optical properties are improved. If you put something there, which is really creating this localized trap states, then it's not helping, and the emission is <coughs> I just want to point out Levi's extreme athleticism to be able to hold that form for this amount of time. <laughs> Somehow you are freezing. You may walk. Uh, We're okay. not frozen for yeah. either of us because Braden's in the same room and we can see him moving on our computer and he can see us moving. So NDSU is the only frozen point. <laughs> You're seeing through the video or in front of But for us, you are freezing. Right. Oh, maybe we still have questions to Alisa. You kind of disappeared so, so quickly. <laughs> I didn't think I you would have asked them. <laughs> Any questions? I mean, review point the last line you said. Just put it to the <laughs> Contradicting information about Tyro. Mm, that was the last slide. So, wait, can you give some information? I mean, example? I don't know what you think. What is the contradicting I didn't information? Understand. I didn't understand what that was, and I didn't explain it. Very well. So, this was saying that it can't connect with the information, and then I didn't actually all the benefits of Tyro, and I was like, hmm. Uh, is it because of concentrations? Because that figure you well, show... it's technically not only concentrations. It's also just different groups reporting different data. Because on the paper... Some showing increase, some showing decrease. The figure she shows the, I mean, line, they are concluding that that's changing because of tile concentration, change the tilet concentration on the surface, and that changes the, uh, the properties. Yeah. properties yeah. And they, again, they make the conclusion, this is not actually was included in her slides, but in the paper, they also, to prove that this silate, they change the pH. So they really yeah. kind of artificially yeah. 
deprotonate uh, the cycle. Mm -hmm. And then they clearly see the quenching of the uh, emission, which kind of showing that, yeah, you have this quenching probably due to the presence of cyclic instead of cyclic. Mm -hmm. so that was <coughs> but actually, there are, there are like different processes, different groups mm -hmm. report in some cases is decrease, in some cases increase. So it's really not very consistent, mm. clear ideas what's really going on in the cycles there. And Dan the next presenter is Dr. Dayton John Fogel. So in your case, it's a research, pre like you will be talking only about your data, about no paper my, presentation. About my data, well, so you, and, and you take responsibility about that. Yeah, so it's a really kind of research of of oh, our team. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the electron dynamics and charge transfer in our CAD 33, Solid 33, with the black dye system. And so this was a system originally created by Pung, um, I don't know, three years ago? <laughs> no, few, maybe years five ago. years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, um, and so he, he applied um, a surface hopping uh, dynamics that uh, Dr. Kalina's group is familiar with. And so I've been taking a look at some of the data and running it through our Redfield uh, theory dynamics. And so we're gonna take a look at a few different things in terms of uh, binding with the dye to the quantum dot and how that's gonna affect uh, the overall charge of the system and how that plays into uh, the electronic structure and eventually the dynamics. Um, and so, you know, the main, the main reason that we're doing this is, again, we're interested in absorbing some form of light into the quantum dot, have an excitation, provide some type of charge transfer so that we can then do redox chemistry either on the surface of the quantum dot or on the dye itself. And so in this case, we're primarily interested in how the hole is transferring um, from the quantum dot to our dye molecule. And so this is, uh, this is a system, and this, this was an image I just put up in VMD. So this is going to be our quantum dot system here, and this is our black dye system. And so you can see this pink atom kind of in the middle is a ruthenium atom, and then you have um, the cyanate groups, uh, three of Technically, them. Technically, it's not atom. Well, it's a metal organic com complex. It's a, an ion. An it's ion. A it's a plus class. two. Yeah. Yeah. It's ruthenium. It's, it's important. <laughs> it, it is important. Um, and so one of the main things that... I've been trying to decipher going back through um, Pung's data and with some of my data is how this carboxylic group is attaching to the surface of the quantum dot. So you can see normally you would have some one of the oxygens be propanated on a carboxylic group, um, whereas here if you have a bidentate um, ligand, so both of the oxygens are binding to the surface of the quantum dot, um, you're deprotonating. Two different cations, right? Yes. Like each oxygen. Yeah, yeah not to the same. Yeah, yeah. And so to two different uh, surface atoms, and with the re, you know deprotonation of the hydrogen atom, there's still the negative charge that gets kept on the system. And so one of the issues we were looking at was a closing of the band gap, and how does you know accounting for this type of charge help or hinder? Oh, before you go to the charge, everyone understands what's the charge on the ligand here? Uh, on, a, on a complex, right? Quantum dots, of course, not charge. It's having uh, even number of cadmium to plus and even, uh, the same number of selenium, uh, selenium, right? Selenium to plus. But do you see the charge on a metal organic complex? So ruthenium is two plus, right? Trees, uh, how it calls, trees. The, the five sided groups. Yeah, they are neutral, right? Well, no, trees, trees pyridine, so how they call it? Like the, the ring guy. Yeah. yeah. So then you, it is a neutral ligand, and then isocyanides, two of them having, it, each of the isocyanides having the negative charge. So technically, if you don't have carboxylic groups, right, so then it has to be neutral because you have two minus due to the ligands, isocyanide ligands, right, and two plus on a metallic comp, I mean, uh, on a ruthenium complex, neutral. But then when you put in the, uh, the carboxy carboxylic or carboxylate groups, if it's deprotonated, then we have a negative charge, which is due to the to the lost proton, right? And then this charge probably really should be originated just through this uh, carboxylic group, should be localized on this carboxylic group, if our calculations are correct. If they're correct. And so, yeah, so we'll go through um, some of the projected density states. 
on these systems. So the first thing I'm going to show you is uh, these are the partial charge densities for this system. And so I've listed, these are going to, on the left, are going to be occupied states, with the HOMO being state 391. And on the right are unoccupied states um, being at 392. And so you can see that the states closest to the band edges, both in the valence band of the occupied, you can see that they're localized primarily um, on this dyed portion of our system. And so that, that's what we're looking for. We want uh, the hole within the valence band to travel up and generate inside the quantum dot and then have a charge transfer event so that it ends up um, being on, you know, spatially separated from the quantum dot and being on the dye so part of the system. And so, again, uh, in the conduction band, we want the opposite. We want the electron that's photo excited to stay on the quantum dot portion of the system. And so you can see uh, the four uh, lowest bands, um, at least that I show here, have their, their density localized on the quantum dot portion of the structure. And so that, yes. So does the initial geometry matters? So matters for what? For, in, oh, in for, terms of, for this type of time. In, Oh, yeah, so, you're, so you're saying that if like the die was kind of bent over and you'd have like pi arrangements? Yes. Um, so yes, I would, I would say it would matter because you'd have different varying levels of interaction. Um, but in this case, um, this, is, this is the way that they're, they're organized. And that this is going to be the, the initial geometry. And so we know that there's going to be... This is up to my geometry. Level. So there's really, uh, if, it's, if it's creating a bond, right? So there is not really a lot of like, if, if you change the, like the question is, you thinking about just changing the angle, right? So then I would say it's probably pretty much optimal angle. Mm -hmm. It's very rigid because uh, the structure of the die has to be octahedral, after right? So you don't have really flexibility to change the structure of the die. So that's why the angle is really kind of fixed. It cannot just be completely flat. Right. Or like yeah. Of course, it deviates a little bit. Uh, and when you do dynamics, you probably will see yeah. how, how this bending angle is uh, changing. Yep. But it's really very small effect. Like you're not expecting that it's completely laid down, right. parallel to the surface or something like this. It's yep. pretty much perpendicular, and it's uh, due to the rigidity of both. Of course, quantum dot is very rigid structure. But this one is kind of rigid due to this octahedral. Uh, you cannot really change the bo the angles of the of the of the bonds because then you will lo lose your octahedral structure at that, at, at that moment, right? Yep. Uh, if you're talking about how these uh, things will be affected by placing this ligand or this die on a different facets, let's say not to the bottom but to the top, I think we don't have the answer, <laughs> right? No. We didn't try. No, I mean there are, well, and, and part of that was, you know, briefly looked at, but inside, so the bulk slab of the, the CAD sulfide, um, then you cut out the quantum dot portion of it, you can see the different layerings of the system, and so there's a little bit of a different surface reactivity in them. But this um, was kind of what was decided as this would be best fit. And so same thing, you know, because you have you know, these two oxygen atoms from the carboxylic group binding to the surface, it's also going to take out any other type of play, even at the anchor group, that might have uh, some type of rotation effect. But what we did in the previous studies not with this complex, but with ruthenium bipyridine complex, which is very similar to this one, but with neutral, uh, there is no isocyanized groups. So uh, protonation, or like trying chelating, uh, like attaching it through the different modes, same facet, same surface, right, but attaching not to, uh, kind of to the same cadmium, uh, to monodentate one cadmium, and actually even protonating, putting the proton on a, on a, on a not really changing this uh, HOMA is always on a die and LUMA is uh, always on a quantum dot. Well, I would say LUMA is not always on a quantum yeah. dot. For the, for the it most might be on a die as well, but HOMA is always on a die. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's the most important piece, just to have the charge separation. So what, what controls for LUMA being on the die or on the dot? Oh, I, like. I, I was wrong. What controls the charge on a ligand? Okay. Not on a not on a carboxylic group, but charge on the actual ligand. Mm -hmm. So because we have in this kind of shift mm -hmm. between the orbitals from the die versus orbitals on the quantum dot, so they kind of too much stabilized if you have neutral ligands comparing to the quantum dot states. And they becoming less stabilized or more destabilized means they're moving and then they kind of introduced to the gap of the quantum dot, making homo being on the die, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if we have uh, negatively charged ligands. 
But we can, we actually, we checked it. We change isocyanates by chlorines. And it was pretty much the same electronic structure. But it's a lower So if you think about like the wedge and dash, you. Oh, they can hear me? My bad, I'm sorry. Hear, yes. <laughs> So in other words, this energy alignment or kind of origin of these uh, states is much more sensitive to the type of the dye by itself rather than to the geometrical features. How is it attached? What's the linkage group? And what's the surface? And so- Can I ask one quick similar related question? Does the presence of the quantum dot change the structure of the um, complex itself? So, for example, it looks like in this particular figure, or in these figures, there's that cyanide group almost looks like it's taking something that would deviate from an octahedral orientation um, in the complex. I guess it depends, like it's a two-dimensional, like if you were looking at it in three dimensions, it's octahedral, right? Yeah. It's, it's reserved, it's octahedral yeah. structure. It is, okay. Yeah. It just the projection due to this 2D. Yeah, 2D I, could, I could turn it around a little bit, it would look better. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. So, one of the things that we are interested in is, well, so I talked about putting this charge on versus not, and trying to compare what we had versus what we what we can get. Um, so, in looking at two two different ways, so I can take my, that whole system, and I'm not going to mess with the number of electrons. I'm just going to put, put the, the system in, I'm gonna optimize it, I'm gonna see what I get. And so doing that is what I call this no charge. So it's neutral. Although you're supposed to have minus on the carboxylic group, but you assume I, that there's no charge. Right. So I'm not I'm not adding any charge to it. So it may be that, you know, it's not quite correct, but I haven't added any charge to it. It's just what the system can calculate. And so that's what this no charge is. And so uh, it also corresponds to the blue um, in this density of states plot. And the second thing that I did was I added this extra electron that we're assuming comes after deprotonation of the carboxylic group. And so that's what the one electron, the red density of states. Um, and then I can talk, I'll talk a little bit about the absorption here and then on the next slide. Um, so in looking- oh, Before you go, so this is done with optimization of the geometry with these different charges, or you just put a charge without changing the geometry? So these ones, um, these ones were taken as, uh, so I have them both. I think these ones were the single point calculations, but I have them optimized with and without. And I think you also have orange. Um, if I have orange, there's not supposed to be orange. Am I? Yeah, am I the only one who's seen orange? Is, is, does it look orange kind of down here? No, okay. I think where the red and uh, purple overlap. Okay, so yeah, so when I when I turn down the transparency on the red, maybe that's why it looks a little ah, different. That okay. way you could see the overlap. I see, when it's covered with blue, then it's kind yeah. of more red. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes um, sense. So yeah, so the blue is just you know the neutral system, and the red is with this additional charge that we're assuming is there. And so you can see, um, you know, there's a shift. Let me see if I have it on the right side. Okay, so this is the two of them separated. Um, I don't, can you guys see? Um, anyways, so I'll just go back. So there's a shift in terms of where the energy levels are, um, almost a, as a relative in between the blue and the red. But you're still going to see. So here you can see a slight partial white space. Um, so this is one of the things that I've been trying to do is get a complete convergence of the electrons in you know single point runs and optimizations because it's not like everything is filled to one or two electrons. So I mean it's it's very very close, uh, but it just is something that I haven't gotten gotten to. Yet. But your gap is open, right? The gap, like in both the gap cases, here, the gap is yes, not uh, it's not zero. closed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which is which is good. Um, and that's what we're looking for. And so that's one of the things I'm curious about in terms of um, what we looked at earlier. So, the, and the features are gonna be very, very similar. You're gonna see uh, you know, lower density of states here at the bottom of the conduction band, whereas the valence band um, is gonna be very dense. Um, and that's gonna play into um, you know, looking at relaxation rates and, and what, might that, what might that lead to. John, uh, can you show by your pointer, 
the Verne's bent top. So the top in, in, yes. one case and then the second okay. case. So in mm -hmm. so it, for the neutral, this this line here um, is going to be the top of the valence band, and for the charged, I mean it's 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 so basically so right at, at the edge of the line. field area has doesn't go up to black line there. Just, is it is it just uh, slightly? Is it deficiency of um, plotting, or it is a <laughs> true occupation below? One occupation. So it is um, P doped. Like me, me but your bank, yeah. a bit. What is it? Like it's right, around right. one so electron volt, right? Or, mm -hmm. or half so of here, electron volt? Yeah, so please. here so here it's, it's a, so this is so uh, this will be cleaner. So this is just a single just one of them. So this is with, with a charge? With no charge. No charge. Um, this is well, this is the one with the charge. <laughs> uh, but it, they're very, very similar. So yes, you're gonna get you know, an open gap, whereas this one has something similar towards the top. Um, and that's, I'll talk about that a little bit later because when I was looking along the dynamic trajectory and doing these PDOS, where the Fermi level was would vary between, you know, oh, two different states depending on that partial occupation. Um, so, they, you know, ideally there's gonna be an open gap and I, I believe that it should be filled it's just that where the Fermi level is relative to the calculated energy states, it's it has a partial occupation just above it. Um, so that but again, we don't have this even small deviation here, right, from mm -hmm. from your completely field versus uh, partial field uh, population, right? We don't have this problem when we put a negative charge as it's supposed well, to be, right. right? So so then like then your black and red completely. It, it's, it's very, very, it's closer. Right. So with the additional charge added in, it's going to push the Fermi level up above yeah. any, have, any state that has then population. And you have a pretty distinct kind of here. Then, here then is you know this is a, a, this is Right, so okay. instead of having, you know, 0.7, it's going to be one point something. So it's going to be a higher occupation. That's kind of the cutoff line in VASP for what, how it does that. If it's above one and less than one, that's where the Fermi line cuts off. Um, but I still want to talk about in the last slide. So this looking at this uh, projected density of states. So this is solely for, um, no, I got this little a bit. Uh, these are relative percentages on the atom types for the HOMO orbital. So with this no charge, you see the bulk of um, the orbital population is located on the selenium atoms um, and on the cadmium. So that would signify that they're supposed to be on the quantum dot instead of being on the die, like we looked at in those partial charge densities. And so um, with the one electron, then you're seeing a reduction in the selenium uh, occupation yeah. as well as uh, the cadmium occupation. And you're seeing the primary localization on the ruthenium, the sulfurs, your nitrogens, and your carbon. So on your actual die portion of the material. So, I think that gives a little bit of a clear indication on which way we need to go. If we need to have our Check. occupation of the homo on the die portion of the material. So, it, so adding this charge into the rest of what I'm doing is what I'm working on currently. But that's so that that was just kind of taking a first look at this and saying what's going on with and without the charge. This is absorption spectra. On the and right? these, yep. And so I'm gonna I'll show this. I think I have a different, I know I have another slide in comparison with what Pung had um, for his. So in terms of our absorption, um, so this no charge system again is here on the red um, and the added electron is the black absorption. And so by providing, you know, this extra electron to the system, now you have a filled occupation level. And so when we're calculating our oscillator strengths and our absorption values, you're not gonna see this small red curve here being some type of artifact saying we have a, you know, we have an empty state that's not really empty right at the edge of the valence band. Um, but looking at the main spectral features, you but, see- but Before you go there, so I kind of want to return back to Dimitri's question when you said like it's a p-doping, right? You said like, looks like it's a p-doping state, right? When you lose, when we not put in the right charge, it's really like we dope the system, well, p-doping because we lost the electron. 
and that's why this level really behaves pretty much the same as we yeah, just take it. Almost, almost like a small trap state bread digit. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, which, which also kind of a note, especially related to the kind of a little bit related to what Talisa was presenting, right? So we can say about that there can be quenching of the luminescence or any kind of change in the dynamics due to the changes in the ligands, uh, like chemistry or attaching, disattaching of ligands. It's also possible of charge, charging, recharging, which, which might be just the charging through the solvent again or something, right? And that's why this kind of artificial behavior might be really kind of just, we can think about, yeah, it should not be there in ideal case, but technically it might be some uh, modeling of the model with extra charge, or kind of, we in our case, it's positive, like I say, it's neutral means we lose an electron, right? Uh, which can be also used as a formation of the defect, and again, uh, affecting the emission and affecting the, the, the overall optical photoexcited dynamics, right? So overall, I think we still can use this data, but just we need to interpret it in a way that suppose that we charge the system, means in our case, it's becoming neutral, which means it's not in the right, uh, balanced charge. Right. So and, right. and, it's and adding this state, which is kind of doping, uh, very analogy to yeah. the dop, uh, do, doping associated state. And yeah, well, absorption spectra also a little bit affected, especially in the yeah. lowest energy states. Yeah. And, and that's part of it too, because you can you know, more or less make the assumption that it should be charged. It's, it's not hard to go back and just artificially implement that for the remainder of, you know, just saying where, where the valence band edges. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in looking at the, the features, so I only ran, well, I only plotted it out to four electron volts, which is just going to be, uh, you know, right at this major peak here um, in this graph. Uh, but when you're comparing the charge and, and no charge systems, you can see that the features are very, very similar in terms of um, shouldering. There's a slight, slight redshift, um, you know, in, in your neutral systems kind of coming off of here. Uh, but it's not major. The biggest thing for me was in looking at where these major peaks occur, you know, primarily very, very close to two, um, and then here close to two and a half, is making sure that they compare with these major peaks, um, which are calculated out as a quantum dot to quantum dot. Because we want, we want the quantum dot to be uh, the photoactive material um, that way you don't necessarily have any type of photo degradation to the dye material that's on the quantum dot surface. And so uh, this quantum dot to quantum dot, major peaks are here, um, coming up just sh uh, shy of two, similar to these here as well. Um, and then you have another major peak set here, close to two and a half, and then um, the relative intensity isn't quite as high because I didn't take into account every possible transition that might occur in the quantum dot, but the same shaping is here as well. And so that's, um, that's what I was looking for. And then again, here just below one and a half EV, um, you do start to see uh, some of these smaller um, absorption peaks that correspond to some of the dye to quantum dot or quantum dot to dye uh, within the system. So overall, uh, fairly happy with at least the shapes and, and where the transitions are coming from in relation to what we've had so, previously. So so the bottom one is again for which system you have in the bottom? So this, uh, so it's 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 punks, right? Yes. Results. So probably yep. it's also with uh, this zero charge. Right. Uh, and so lost lost electron. <laughs> part of me is system. It, right. Part of me was wondering if it's just a blown up portion of what yeah. you know, the static quantum dot, this this lower energy portions are. Yeah. That's just here. Okay. So I wasn't really. I I want to. I guess he, it's literally part. red and black lines right, from which, this curve. Which is up here. Die to yeah. quantum dot and uh, yeah. die die die. To die, die. die. Yeah. So that's that's what I'm assuming. Yeah. So the left panel is for no charge system. Mm -hmm. Why there is no absorption in the like zero? This this one here is what yeah. you're talking about. That's. That's a good question. I don't know if it's something, because it looks like it cuts off here. Um, so I don't know if he didn't go below he might something just, like this. He might have stopped it. it. Or depending on the Gaussian broadening. Um, well, there is some feature in the 0.5, right? So it's kind of so like, it's, it's not zero, right? It's zero 0.5 electron yeah, I mean, volts where he's point, this point peak. 0.5 is right at just, you know, so it looks like it starts just, just, just after yes, 0.5, exactly. so I don't know. Exactly. I'll have to go back and. And, and also, uh, 
your spectra is just a single point, present, uh, mm -hmm. single point. And this one, is it also, or it's averaged over several several structures from the dynamics? Ooh. Do you know? That's okay. I'm not sure. It I'll was not check. in your paper. Uh, yeah. Well, when I was looking at, because they were separate fig, uh, figures and, and paper, um, most recently I was looking well, at the captions Technically, because the, figures, the features... But, the features looks very similar to yours, probably it's a single point as well. Yeah. But this one is for TDTFT, right? Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. It's vast calculations. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so he it's, did. It's, okay. it's uh, yep. oh, close. Single, single uh, particle spectra. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he did both VASP and he did um, some Gaussian, which I haven't added in, but I also have some of that to compare with. Just uh, but, but this is for sure it's a VASP then. Yeah. Yep. For his system. Yep. Okay. So in the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about our methodology and the steps that we take. We do ground state calculations in Gaussian and VASP. We look at what, um, you know, the energy levels and how, it, how it's, um, the charge is, is localized on the systems. And then we talked about molecular dynamics and how now we're moving our atoms and how that changes the energies in our system. So this, this was, well, these are the energy levels so these squiggly lines going horizontally is one cone sham orbital energy across a, you know, a little over a 4,000 femtosecond trajectory. So this is um, something I've been trying to make sense of and, and use it for where my orbital range is but for what, our what is your calculations. So when we were looking, we found, so looking at the Fermi energy, you're looking at it almost right between two very, very tight states. But this is with this is incorrect charge. Right. So, I mean, it's hard to say how big of a difference the single charge would have on a dynamic simulation, but I don't know if it would be drastic, per se. So that, that's just one thing that um, I don't know if I'm going to run a sh just a short segment of a charge and do a comparison mm -hmm. and just take a look at it. Just um, to see whether you will be able to separate. Right. Well, also your ground state calculation shows very similar band gaps, right? But you have a very different shift in a Fermi energy, right? As you said, that you have almost completely, well, right. not, not a problem of half field uh, orbitals right. when you have a right charge. Yep. And this probably would be al already good enough to kind of maybe split them. Right. And so, but this, this also raised another question. Because, so this was the energy file that came with all of his, his real or coupling files in the directory. So this was, in the figure, um, another fluctuation part or plot of his energies. But here you can see he put, well, so they're shifted to have the Fermi energy at zero. That's, well, that's used, not what I'm looking at. He used the uh, cold calls, the Caesar, Caesar operator, okay. so kind of because, artificially right, just. So uh, now he has this large and band gap and where he puts the Fermi energy, which doesn't match where the Fermi energy is calculated out to be inside the system. So he just kind of used it randomly? Like in other words, his home, like in your well, case, yellow is your homa, right, so oh no, you, backward, blue is your homa, right, yellow is your right, luma. So if you're looking here, I mean, you could basically kind of split it out. But the other, the other thing I was, I was thinking about was, so you look at, you know, you have this, this range from negative three to negative five electron volts and how sparse some of these states get. And you think back to how the valence band and the conduction bands look, you have conduction bands um, having, you know, a much lower density of states. Because they come in, are they coming from the quantum dot or from yeah, the Yeah, so band? these are from the quantum dot, right, compared to this valence band edge, which is going to be very dense. And so part of me is curious about where these fluctuation energies are coming from, because to me it would make more sense, because you have, you know, the severely dense pot you know, population of states be close to the valence band, or, and then the top of the conduction band is going to have you know a few more of these states that are localized on the plug on. So but that's we need to put a charge and see how the dynamics yeah. goes. Yep. Because it's again, if we're thinking about p doping, this is really maybe the states originated from the p doping. On one hand, on the other hand, these states if they come in from the dye. Right, so they are sparser, of course. Than the, like in other words, your gap for the quantum dot would be between this, I don't know, this dense band right. and then yep. around minus four or something. And these sparse states probably coming from the ligand, which of course we expect they have to be more split, more discrete. Yep. yep. So yeah. So 
we'll run a short segment um, and take a look and see what's how they overlap and see if you can actually get some of that opening. And from that, we can decide if what we want to do with it in the future. And so that's the main reason I had this image in there um, was you know just to look at the comparison of because I was looking at both of them. I was took me a little bit to figure out kind of what was going on with why he but all how did he define like where exactly he applied the CZ operator? Was it applied between this yellow and blue line or or between some other lines? Well, to me, it looks like it, it's up above a little ways. So he kind it, of this blue line stays right. in a in a like right. So it, it, so it almost looks like if it was here or here. Uh -huh. um, so and that's part of why I'm curious if he had a different energy outcome from something that I well, that I don't have. Here we have, a, of course, because we treat electrons and hold separately when we do dynamics, right? Mm -hmm. And then kind of taking out the unoccupied levels and call them occupied. They have different nature, like, you know, all the dynamics will be affected completely, like, pretty significantly. Yeah. I mean, for electrons, using these levels and call them holes, and for electron dynamics, it just means that he having the relaxation to the, not not to the luma, but to somewhere kind of somewhere. in the main band, right? Yeah. But for holes, it really looks like we, we are pretty off with uh, low, uh, low, uh, right. low state uh, kind of dynamics mm -hmm. because it's completely different nature of these orbitals. And again, another problem with this, uh, so like people who work in this VASP, you know that we can address the band gaps if we use the PBE functionals, if we, or whatever your functional, pure GGA functionals. So because the band gaps are underestimated. So they are smaller than they're supposed to be in the real systems, right? And that's why even closing these gaps is, is definitely the artifact of the functional. If we use hybrid functional, then the gap probably will return back to one electron volts or something, right? And we will not, even with this charge system, and we will not have this problem at all. Yeah, and even in the HSE calculation that's running, you can see that it's starting to open up. Oh, you start already? That, yeah, well, when the power went off, it was in the middle of the calculation, so it kind of reset. But looking at the other car files, the, uh, the state distribution it looks like it's... So yeah, so that was, this, this image was the main reason I put this one up there. Um, we, we may talk about some of these figures a little bit later, uh, but for right now, we're gonna, um, so kind of move on. So in terms of, um, you know, looking at the dynamics, we were interested in how the density of states and where the, the charge is being localized <laughs> changes along this dynamic trajectory. And so this was, I mean, this is just a video of a density of states that, um, you know, taking it every hundred, well, for the first picosecond, every, let's see if I can do that slower, um, every, every hundred femtoseconds, so it doesn't do it that way. But you can kind of see in this system, you have a very, yeah, it's really quick, but you have, you know, almost an overpopulation um, in this. And so that was, uh, that, that's partly, I think, along the dynamics, you have some stretching of bonds, you have some, um, you know, bond angling being shifted due to this atomic motion and also improper charge on the system. And so you get a, a, a unique uh, density of states that I don't think is necessarily um, correct, but we're working on going back and recharging it the way it should be done, and we'll see once how um, but this comes out. Here you feel like this occupied state, this is based on your, I'll say, on, on the Fermi energy as it is calculated by VASP, or it's based on the way how, how, <coughs> how Pan was using his scissor operators? This is, this is the way I calculate so there's no scissor operator okay. in that video. So, so again, so your low state is half field or right, close to right. half field. That's why again, your black line and the covered right, line is not exactly kind of size. Yeah. yeah. So if you haven't caught a theme, correct charge is kind of a big deal. Um, okay. So this is this is kind of what we were. There's a lot of information. So the axes, x is time in femtoseconds, y is a population percentage, and then each one of these. Uh, colored lines corresponds to um, an atom type, so this is just the PDOS but the, at... This is for which level? This is the HOMO mm. at a number of different time Means steps. HOMO based on the Fermi energy, yes. right? HOMO based on the Fermi energy. Mm -hmm. So... Which, 
why did you took this uh, sparse steps? Are you confident that uh, nothing interesting happens in between, or you just got tired to plot too many points? Well, by the way, is it is it how it was calculated with this? Uh, like we have in what what's the board team for calculation? What is the step in a time? This one five or less? Oh, well, so well. Oh, in terms of what he did for dynamics, I'm not sure. I don't have his in car. I think okay. so. so it's, it's actually your, your choice of this. Yeah. So I just I took it every hundred for the first picosecond, and then every five hundred for the rest of the trajectory. So part of it is I wasn't sure how we were charging the system, so I didn't want to just burn through a ton of resource and lock everything up. So I took a sparse kind of a sparse density of this. So I'll go back and do this. I've got a script ready to run every femtosecond, but you know, maybe we'll only do it for like 100 or 200 and see once how it goes. Um, so but it gives you just more smooth lines, nothing else, right? So you still will have this, like, right. such it, a it big deviation definitely will stay, right? So it will be exchange of population between the same, between orbitals of the same symmetry. Like, um, if we look on the 500 and 1000 peak, it's probably due to the. If we connected this two peak, it will get a shape of the like red letter on 2000 peak. What? what? I mean, if we if we look on the 500 to 1000, okay. that have a spike, right? Yeah. But if we get a res calculate in every 500, then we will get only. Yeah. But this is probably depends on this again how close the luma is, right? Yep. Again, this yellow oh, bluish yeah. line. Sometimes they come much closer. Yep. Sometimes they a little bit yeah, more split it, and probably at higher, uh, at, at, at longer times they we have a little bit <coughs> increase in yeah. uh, splitting, yep. and here they really kind of almost degenerate, and that's yep. why you have this. Uh, and that's switching. that's a huge part of it. So in looking yeah. at where the Fermi level but cut off, is it? <coughs> Again, same as in your ground state calculations. So what is supposed to be luma is a quantum dot state or not? Uh, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be die. The luma should be quantum die. The luma should be should be die. And so the Fermi energy oftentimes was right between where there was full occupation and partial occupation. And so it would do that. And so that's why you're seeing, so this top line here is for cadmium. Right here, uh, nope. uh, for selenium, it's kind of a brown. And so you can see that it, there's a very drastic change in where it's happening because it would jump in between those states for what is homo and what isn't. And so it would shift it from the quantum dot to the die to the quantum dot to the die. And that's why you'd see these really large population percentages on the quantum dot at certain time points along the trajectory versus you know these points in between here are localized on the ruthenium and the sulfurs, um, and you've got you know your nitrogens creeping up here as well. So depending on how these occupations are happening, um, and this is just all done with the neutral charge, so putting that you know extra electron in there should smooth it out, and we should be able to see a more consistent basis for a homo population will be almost entirely localized on our dye versus. And what again is the green one? Uh, the green one is ruthenium. And the blue or the black? Blue, the blue is for sulfur in here. And this brighter blue is oxygen. So this is, yeah, these, these points kind of right through here. But, but your carboxylic group, is it contributing? Like carbons and oxygen so, from the carboxylic group? Yeah, so you're going to, I mean, the oxygens don't have a ton of charge on them. That's this brightest blue line on the bottom. Uh -huh. And then the carbons are this darker blue line different. kind of through here. Yeah. And so that's, that's, that's what it's looking like. So when we're talking about orbital indices switching, it's it's happening because there's an artifact with actual the, uh, populations. State. Yeah. Right. We don't so, actually have the gap in the system, right. in other words. Right. Yep. So going back, gonna be we'll go through all that again. Um, but for states. sure, like you can see, like you you need at least the thousand first thousand where we have this a lot of uh, mm -hmm. things happening, right? So I would suggest this is would be nice to to run with a charge and see the dynamic and then kind of do the same analysis and to see how how this picture will change with, changing with or maybe yep. also uh, fluctuating right. if you and have the right charge being on right. a carboxylic. And ideally, yeah, it'll be almost exclusively like this with you know 
minimal occupation. Or like when I showed the PDOS on the very first NC State slide, you see a large for the no charge and not. And another approach, because again, we have this problem due to the functional, right? Because again, if you use the hybrid functional, even with the wrong charge, the gap is open, right? We don't have this problem. So which means, again, another alternative would be to rerun everything with HSC or PB1 functional to open the gap and then again yeah. eliminate, uh, get rid of this problem. Yeah. And so when this is done, when the HSC is done for the no charge, um, I'll compare it to the charge one that's running and, and just we'll look I hope at you're it. not waiting. You also run this job right away. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so that, that's, that's what this is about. Um, oh, so I was going to compare that with, oh, I don't have it on the next slide. I have it in a few slides later. So. <clears throat> We've looked at the molecular dynamics portion of it um, and how it's kind of affecting the energies and the distribution of the charge. And now we're going to look at just a few of the results that come from the electron dynamics. So I'll take some of the surface hopping data from Pung that he had. Um, and I'll look at, I'll show some examples of the red field data that I produced, um, do a comparison of some of the time scales. Um, but even looking at, you know, how these rapid fluctuations are occurring from quantum dot to die. Um, may help me make some sense of, of uh, some questions that I had. Um, with our Redfield tensor, in looking at you know, the relative transition probabilities, you know, we've, we've seen these over the last couple of weeks. Um, this is looking at the entirety of the system. This is just the nicer image localized around um, the Homo Lumo uh, portion of it. So you can see here, this is kind of the Homo Lumo, um, and we're just looking at a small portion of that in different coloring. One thing that I noticed um, and that I was thinking about on the way here, so if we look at the amplitude of this Redfield tensor, uh, we'll see it goes from 0 to 6. And normally we have it from 0 to 6, but at 10 to the negative 3. And so, um, so it's much when, when, I, well, when I was thinking about much it, we take... Larger, right? Right, so it's much larger. But then part of me was wondering about when you generate if there's any type of uh, scaling when you calculate the real files versus our coupling files, if there's any time scale difference, because we take our couplings um, or in the, our, our matrix and then multiply it to get it into the right units. And so that's I just need to, that's something I just need to go back and look no, at because it should be that they should be the same. So it's what again you convert to the right units couplings? So to get it in our MATLAB code so that it has the right units of time. It's, it's just taking times a factor of three. But you're converting to time, what is converting to time? What is the pot use? Time step, right? Mm -hmm. this, is, this was my question. I think we typically have a pot, if, if pot team equals to one, right? Mm -hmm. So then the time is second just time to second. second, so it's a right. real, real yep. time, right? Yep. You don't need to convert it to anything. Right. If it is with a larger step, which is typically for inorganic materials, I don't know, for silicon you also wear Doing this or not? Same stuff. Yeah. One? One? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But, but for titanium dioxide, you are taking lunch? No. Mm -hmm. Take it one. Oh, okay. But yeah, so for cat selenite, less selenite, we we make in pot team five means you kind of right. have a larger well, step. You don't have any vibrational frequency slower than that or faster than that. Yeah, but I think in this system, I hope he didn't do it. I hope he was really doing with every femtosecond. Right. Then there should not be any units conversion yeah. or anything, multiplication okay. or division. Right. No, then, but anyways, so these these very large, um, you know, tensor transition, <laughs> right, tensor <laughs> elements or transition probabilities leads to very, very fast relaxation times, which is ideally what we're looking for. So what we want to have happen is we but want... But this large, this probably, again, based on the very high couplings. Mm -hmm. Like, I think if we compare just the cup, average, like if we calculate the average couplings and I have the screens, Jabet can help you with it. Well, how you can so I mean, calculate. This, this is basically an average over all your couplings. Okay, yeah. So, that's so I think it also would be much larger values comparing to, let's say, just bare quantum dot or like uh, mm -hmm. other systems you were yeah. working on. And again, this might be really due to this artifact of the degenerate state. Because in a couplings, you also have energy difference is also contributing yeah. uh, kind of, you know, in your, I think it's in a new numerator or denominator, don't remember where mm -hmm. it is, but it definitely contributes to have you write, like again, you have, you have, <laughs> you have this energy uh, splitting, right, in, in, in between the states, 
is already kind of inserted to the couplings. Right. So if you have degenerate states, of course your couplings is growing just due to this fact. Plus, it's also kind of artificial delocalization, or how say hybridization of orbitals. If the states are degenerate, then any quantum software will just decide, if the state is degenerate, then where it should be localized, on the quantum dot on the die. Or maybe it's a superposition, right? right? And then if it's a superposition, then this is our hybridized states. And of course, then your couplings not coupled between localized orbital quantum dot versus localized orbital of the die, right. and then just switching between yeah. them during the time. Yeah. It's really just hybridized state. Yeah. And then of course, the couplings will be huge. Yeah. So, yeah. so there are two artificial right. things. There are two artificial kind of effects which both just originated through these problems that our homo luma is too close to each other. Yep. And so, in, so these are two examples of uh, the time scales for the electron hole relaxation using Redfield theory. Um, so I'll start here. So this table up top is just a list of the highest oscillator string transitions. So these are the most probable optical transitions from the system that I calculated. But um, can you say where you excite? Like if you go to your absorption spectra, can you just kind of at least yep. roughly say where you excite it? Yep, so I'll highlight this first before I go back there. So this D is just the excitation energy. So we're looking at energy differences between I and J of you know close to 2.2, 2.7, um, so, but which peak it is? Like so, it's your second peak or? Uh, yep, so it'd be, it'd be close to the secondary peaks. So because we're looking at you know this two and a half region um, and then close to, again, three. So then we're looking up here. So these, oh, wow, so it's so really there, there excited, some, very high. Yep, so there are some here. Um, and then at these major peak points is, is kind of the distribution of, of where those absorptions are coming from. And so, um, yeah, so when you get to, you know, the 2.0, 1.9, those are that first front end peak. Uh, 2.4, 2.2, those are kind of the secondary, and then we get to some of the higher ones. Um, and so in the majority of these types of transitions, you're looking at quantum dot to quantum dot transitions lining up with what the absorption spectra said. Um, and if we're looking at these dynamic plots, you know, we're looking at this red is where the electron has been populated, blue is where a hole has been generated, and so you can see that, you know, even on a log scale, I only had it plotted from minus three to minus one. So we're looking at a femtosecond um, to 100 femtoseconds. And the relaxation times are happening here, past, just past 10 femtoseconds. So we're on a scale of, you know, tens of femtoseconds. So it being an ultra fast relaxation process uh, for both the electrons and the holes in almost all of these. Well, for electrons, you're already there. It's right. nothing to it's, relax, actually. Right. You're already on, at yep. the age of the... Yep. But for holes, you are having a super quick... Right. And I mean, it's... Huh. So part of that is, you know, these, these tensor elements are going to be really large, and so the transitions are going to be calculated fast. But can you, can you really... I guess you didn't check, but where you really excite? You think you're exciting the quantum dot to quantum dot transition? At this, at this yeah. kind of so brighter I, state. So, um, I'll pull the same. I'll put the same PDOS data that I had earlier, and I can. I have it for these states. I just didn't print it out here, and so then you can see where it's kind of localized and to where it's going. Um, and so, you know, the good thing is, they're both on the same magnitude of the time scale. Um, because it's, it's important to have both of the charge carriers be at about the same rate. That way you don't have a buildup of one and every, you know, have recombination occur. Um, but, so yeah, so. Again, 100 or 10? 10 uh, and So it's, you know, it's, it drags out a little bit. So you're looking at, you know, 20 to 50 kind of um, femtoseconds in this range here. And so. So it's less than 100 femtoseconds. Less than 100 femtoseconds. Wow. And so when I was looking at some of the data from Pung, looking at his type of uh, exponential fitting to the electron and hole relaxation, well, here's his 100 femtosecond mark, and you're seeing the bulk of the relaxation occur inside 50, 60 femtoseconds. So, you know, both, both methods are giving um, very similar results, 
um, even to hold the holes and the electrons. And so I'm not, I'll have to go back and, and talk to you guys a little bit about where you decide that relaxation occurs. But I mean, just fitting those rates um, to the exponential fit, um, they're going to be very, very similar. So this, so when we were talking earlier about that, those sharp edges in that PDOS at the HOMO edges, so one of his calculations, or he had plotted out here, was the population on the die, which is on top, and the population on the quantum dot, which is on the bottom, as a function of the first 100 femtoseconds. So you can see on the die, it starts at zero, and the quantum dot starts at one. So we photo excite the quantum dot, and as we go through time, um, you're looking at you know, the electronic population, and then you get to this area here where you have these huge switches of the charge hopping from one to another. And so I don't know if that's, I'm trying to think if that's the same artifact coming into play or if you really would have that drastic of a, of a jump or just because your gap is so close that it's jumping from one to another. Because I don't. But this jump happens at which scale? I can, can so it's about, it's about 15 femtoseconds. Kind even, of even weaker than your final. Okay. Yeah, probably by that, again. Somehow the relaxation, like even even if you excited kind of a deep hole, right? So really deep to the valence band, it looks like somehow the relaxation to this ages of this unclear homo luma right. uh, ranges, right? Yeah. Of these kind of sparse states which we yeah. don't know where to address, is happening extremely fast. Right. Well, and I mean the density of those states in the valence band is very very dense, you well, know. Versus we the see the same band. thing so with a quantum dot, with a yeah. bare quantum dot, right? Yeah. Oh. And, and the relaxation is not as quick. Right. It's quicker seconds, yep. not, not right. less than 100 so. seconds. So it's really kind of some interesting behavior of this system. And it's really even, it looks like it's pro probably not really so much related with the problem of the Homo Luma question, right? Because, for, well, for electrons, for sure it does. But for, because you're excited very close to the age, of the, uh, close to the band room what we call band gap. Mm -hmm. uh, but for holes, it looks like you're exciting it at almost two electron volts below this strange area, right? So means means that you, you should be there kind of in a regular quantum dot states. Yeah. And and it's it, reaching this age of, uh, of states very, very quickly, right. which is really strange. I don't know what exactly is the origin of this mm -hmm. behavior. Um, I'm going to ask you a question which Daniel may uh, answer on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you see any connection between this feature and the approach practiced by Oleg Prezdo in his papers by splitting electron transfer, charge transfer onto non-adiabatic component and adiabatic component? Right. Would it be possible to call this adiabatic charge transfer? I'm, I'm not telling that, that it is. I'm, I'm wondering myself. If you return back to your figure for, for, for the density of... St uh, for the Almost fluctuations. Yeah. yeah. So this is your adiabatic charge transfer, right? But um, it looks okay. very similar, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure if it would qualify. Like it... Okay. Right, because if you would have crossing without actually allowing it to cross and just so it's fluctuating between indices switching mm -hmm. well yeah yeah I mean then you, you you will tell what is adiabatic charge transfer yes I'm trying. <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. yeah so we'll have to we'll have to sort some of this out but we're good there um, so yeah, so that's kind of um, the story on, on this set of systems, and I'm sure, well maybe not sure, but in a couple weeks go through our other set of organic systems for a photo charge transfer. Um, but, you know, an important part we talked about in the beginning is looking at the charge of the quantum dots based on the deep propagation, how the ligand is binding to the surface of the quantum dot, um, and how important that charge is to the energy spacings. Um, and the opening of our gaps so that we can go through um, and get our relaxation rates. And so when we're talking just briefly now about some of these, you know, really close band gap issues with index swapping or adiabatic relaxations, and, and so just basically writing that potential, 
um, we need to get that ironed out so we're not having these artificial um, switchings happen. Um, and then, you know, the relaxation rates, the time scales are just really fast, faster than they probably should be. Um, so we'll have to look at um, either qualitatively looking at relative relative time scales and trying to extrapolate out to um, um, uh, other systems or, or Can looking at... Can you come at, back to your figure with your charge, no charge, uh, ground state, uh, density of state? Yeah, this is where I'm comparing. I'm kind of thinking like... Again, can it be such a fast relaxation again, some kind of effect that is not properly charged system? And, and, and yeah, of course they are shifted, but I don't know, the density of states looks not very different in between. No, I mean. So the blue they, they one, have, no charge. Right. So like all features are the same? All right, the they're, they're very, very similar in terms of, you know, what the peaks are. You have a little bit of difference. Um, but I would not go it. so far away like, Kind of right, thinking so about the area where you excite yeah. it, it kind of two electron volts below this home, uh, home range, right? Yeah. Yep. So, so kind of and first, then it's uh, like, like on this figure, it's probably hard to see. Like it's yeah. So this this is which this is the no charge right here, and this is the charge. So I mean, the main difference is you have just this little bit of a you know protrusion on the valence band edge, where it looks like there's one more peak, so you have that extra shoulder, whereas in the no charge, you know, it sits all the way up here. And, and here, this kind of pulls away versus, you know, these just kind of almost twin peaks. So it just shifts it just But enough. overall, at this range, two electron volts from the age of the, of the valence band, mm -hmm. oh, of the age of yeah. the valence band, right? Yeah. So if you compare, right. like you, you have this three sharp peaks, mm -hmm. there's like one sharp and then kind of more smooth, yeah. almost featureless peak. And, and this might also, which means in this case you have some kind of sub bands, sub 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 gaps right. in the uh, in the valence band. Here you probably have really very smooth uh, yeah. states. So and this also might be affecting the uh, the quick relaxation of the whole. Yeah. Maybe I don't know. Well, at least at least because the density of states are not exactly identical. I, I mean I I agree. So far away you go from the valence band, from the band gap, they look more, more and more alike. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this area, you see some significant features, mm -hmm. uh, which are really make these guys very different. So, so overall, I mean, it's it's mainly really the, the effect of the charge, yeah. not only because of this uh, right. closing yeah. the gap, but because of these changes in the electronic levels. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, if it is. You know, the other thing when we were talking about where is that extra charge localized, should it be on the carbonic silic group? Well, if you have it where, I mean, that's where your main feature changes are, you know those those states are localized on the die, so you know it's somewhere on the die, because that's that's where the, the states are shifting a little bit. If you're adding or removing one electron, should it be spin polarized? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it depends on the initial system. But either, so, either one of those needs spin polarized. Right, so which, in, which one in, has unpaired? So, in this one, this one is unpaired. In some of our other systems that we're looking at, adding the additional electron puts it back to an even electron count. It's just dependent on the, the chemical makeup. And uh, in uh, your electron added, mm -hmm. it looks like there, there is still. Uh, can you slowly move your yes higher up? Higher, higher, backwards, backwards to the negative, to the Valence stop band. here. There is a white spot. Yeah. So it means it's still missing. Yeah, because we lose electron. It has to be there. But it is there, there is a missed electron in both configurations. No, no. In one configuration, well, you have so all electrons. So, so, so yeah. So, so there's a there's a no charge system and then an additional electron. But yes, in both density of states, there's a partial occupation missing. So if I go to this one, so you can see it right here, there's a small space where it's not completely occupied. And then here in the no charge, there's a small space. Would it be crazy to add two electrons? No, I've also tried that, but that pushes everything above the band gap. And so then there's the conduction bands populated. And so then, then you get something similar to uh, what I had in here, where you have almost no gap because it's just a continuation into well, the states. Well, I think the easiest way to really get rid of this, put a proton on a carboxylic group, right? 
and just take one of them. And then it's neutral. Re and remove, then remove one of the bonds and just huh? remove a bond and just protonate the yeah. oxygen one. Well, kind of, you don't need to remove, you just put the proton and then and it will be optimized or yeah. when you run the dynamics, it right. will it, kind it, of it put should, itself yeah. in the right way. Yeah. It will probably kind of losing this uh, strong coordination with the cadmium, right? Mm -hmm. Because proton is there. Or maybe it's actually deprotonated naturally. It might also prefer to lose the proton right. and proton and will go somewhere to the surface. Yeah. 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 So actually, I don't think you need to optimize the structure. You can just put a proton, kind of uh, run the dynamics for first, how, uh, how many femtoseconds or how many picos, how, how long are you need to do the non-abetic non dynamics uh, to apply your uh, red field theory? 10. 10? Well, I mean, I would, I mean, femtosecond. Oh, 10 femtosecond. Uh, wow. I mean, we normally, normally we run for a picosecond, but since you're averaging over couplings, you can run as few or as many as you it want. It just increases error bar in the yeah. reported yeah. rates. Yeah. So I mean, well, I, could, I could run you know, like three, to, uh, three to five. Then it looks like you can, speed. like, it looks like to get up to 100 fem per second, uh, like really rerun all this uh, dynamics, probably not a problem at all, right? Yeah. And you already start with HSC, kind of exactly same settings as kind of not real, not 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 accurate. Uh, how say neutral, but in the wrong way, yeah. right? So with a with a with a lost electron, then uh, you will add the charge, and also probably do HSC calculations, because they definitely will open the gap, and we will get rid of this problem, and then protonate, put a proton. I said like, don't optimize, just put a proton. Well, of course, yeah. figure out Reasonably what would be close. reasonable yeah. distance yeah. oxygen hydro uh, OH bond from carboxylic yeah. group, and think about angles are pretty flexible for hydrogen yeah. in this case. So put a proton, put a neutral, and then of course it's a neutral charge, right? And and also run at least 100 fem per second. Yeah, let me see that. Also, also with HSC. Okay. Right? Because okay. even with protonated system, we might still have, might, might have a very small band gap. In this case, the gap is reduced, not really because of the charge, but it's also reduced because we have states from the quantum dot uh, or let's say states from the ligand, or from the dye, right, localized on the dye, they're kind of getting inside the band gap of the quantum dot. And that's why they can really come very close to the edge of the conduction band and kind of close the gap. And if your gap is already too small for about one electron volt difference yeah. with, uh, with this functional, right, instead of two electron volts, we have only one electron volt band gap for the, for the PBE functional, for the pure GGA functional. And then kind of adding, adding these states coming from the ligand, of course, will be uh, closing the gap whether you have a charge or not have, have a charge. Right. So that's why I think if you, if you already start running HSC and you can do it, right, looks like you don't have any technical issues with that, at least for how many, how many femtoseconds have you done already with HSC? Well, at I mean, I said, it, I said it to run 100 steps, and it was up to about 60, and then the power went out, okay. and so it's, it's, it's okay. back to like yeah. a little over 20. So I mean, I could, I could stop it, because the, the energy change in between steps really isn't that large. It's getting close to my convergence limit. So I mean, I could just kill it and look at what it is, or just pull the information. Or just continue, you don't need to kill it. Like, right, just put it in a new directory and look at what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I would suggest like three calculations, but with a different functional. And then we can use this preliminary data just like more technical issues for really showing that GJ functional is definitely not a choice in this case, right? And then effect of the charge and so on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we probably will not have again if we don't need to really run up if 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 HSC is opening the gap, and then we don't have the switching between different types of orbitals, right? If we see Luma will be always on a quantum dot or whatever on a die, Homa always on a quantum dot or backward, right? So then, kind of, we don't need really to run uh, for so long time. And yeah, you just take, I would say 10, maybe too small, but at least 100 spam per second. 100 would be sufficient. Yeah. Hopefully, for, hopefully for this would be enough uh, with a red field theory. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, other than that, that that's basically Yeah, so you just restart problem. three jobs, right? Yep. One is really changing the, putting the extra atom, right? And it's probably the most significant change in your, uh, in your overall files. The other ones is really just playing with the charge and the functional. Yep. That's it. Unless you got questions. Questions one? No, no, questions no. We go, we go everyone. Questions three? And now we start the circle. <laughs> <laughs>
So you have uh, two systems. So uh, uh, one is the no, no air charge, and another is one electron added. Right? Mm -hmm. So for the red field tensor and the dynamics calculation, you calculated for one electron added. So for the red field, um, so it had been done. Someone else had done the coupling calculations before me, mm -hmm. and I don't believe they used an extra electron in those calculations, and so on. I just have those coupling files. So mm -hmm. what I have for the red field is without the charge. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it wouldn't be hard to go back, just take 100, well, I could just take 100 of his, his files, add a new in charge, run the couplings, and we could compare that that way. That would be simple enough, too. So, so you actually don't know? Right? Not yet. No, I mean, with, with the way it looks, it doesn't look like he put an extra charge in there, but. No, for sure, it was neutral. Yeah. For sure. So. He just didn't know how to do it. Oh, okay. Because we discussed it. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so that'll be something. I just was hoping that, like, my suggestion was to put a proton, but I think he didn't put a proton, he just he said, oh, put a proton and then don't worry about the charge. He have heard the last part of my sentences. Don't worry about the charge. <laughs> so, he didn't. <laughs> okay. We go this way then. It's your turn. <laughs> I do not have any specific questions today. And we can go away. I'm going to continue. Okay, we can turn to yeah. and Where's the extra charge? Like when you put it in? Like where is it located in the model? So that was when we were looking at, you know, this change in um, the PDOS portion of it. And looking at, it. so this extra, extra shape here on the edge of the density of states, kind of what we were talking about earlier is the main change in the electronic structure. And so these states are all localized on the die itself. Um, and so not only is it flipping uh, where the HOMO level is, it's adding that charge onto uh, the die portion of the, of the molecule. But can you say exactly on which portion of the die? On which portion? Because you expect not, not, that this charge, this charge should be on the oxygen probably. So you haven't looked at the power charges yet? Uh, yeah, so not, not, from, not from this. I would have to um, go back and count which exact. But, but this is a portion of your projected dose. Why not? Well, so this is just. Oh, because it's projected dose. It's not really for the entire system. It's not total right. charge because, of course, you yeah. expect the total charge should be coming from the uh, carboxylic group. Yeah. yeah. It should be localized in the carboxylic group, but yeah. but not necessarily that your HOMA will be really associated with the right. carboxylic group. Right. So this is this is solely for the HOMO level, and the charges off of the HOMO. It's 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 nearby, but it's not. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a good question. We need total yeah. uh, distribution of the total charge yeah. to answer this question, because yeah. then we clearly see how how the yeah. charge is distributed, neutral versus not. I think we immediately see the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you knew where the charge is located, too, that would give you an idea of how it would impact the rates during the dynamics. Yeah. But again, intuitively, you expect that this should come from the carboxylic group, right? because this is the source of your charge. Mm -hmm. Isopropanating or deprotonating, you really have in this electron in the carboxylic group. And then, wherever the carboxylic group is mainly contributing, this is where we have the most effect. Yep. Good question. So, should we go then? <laughs> I don't have any questions. No, you have to. <laughs> you can just wait for a while to. to I don't think so. Okay, but we return back to you. So you have to have a question. I have two very generic questions. <gasps> Do you want to share yeah. one question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 this job. Uh, so for my first question, I know you talked about it, but I must have just zoned out when you said it. Uh, why are you redoing the calculations? So when we're looking at um, where the charge is localized on the system, and where we we can back to your structure, or to this one. Yeah. yeah. So we're looking at it because, so the HOMO level right now, you can see is localized on the die. Mm -hmm. And the LUMO is localized on the quantum die, as it should be. In the calculations without specifying this extra electron, you get some mixing. And so these states will swap with each other. So did he, was his data published or not? No, no, no. No, no okay. 
Alright, so you're we just want, going back. We want to make them publish, that's why we're trying to figure out oh, what's going on there. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Yep. Exactly. Like, I understand. So, we Okay, so my second question is what would this be used for? Oh, yep. the system. Yeah, I don't, I'm not familiar with it at all. Yep. So, in, in this type of metal organic um, making quantum dot, so we want to absorb light on the quantum dot itself have the hole relax to the dye, and once we have the charge outside on this ligand, we can have some type of, of chemistry happen with this extra charge localized on the dye. So you can have redox chemistry, you could do um, oxygen generation, um, that type of photo photocatalytic reactions. So there are two applications. One is use this system for the photovoltaic, and the second one for the photocatalysis. Okay. So for photocatalysis, uh, the idea is that you need uh, the ruthenium 2 plus has to be switched on to ruthenium 3 plus. And it's known that this complex is, you can modify ligands, but maybe it's a ruthenium property. It really works as a good oxidizer. Okay. So you yeah, need to really sense. switch your ruthenium 2 plus to ruthenium 3 plus. And that's why we need this charge transfer, hole transfer from the quantum dot, right, in photo excite quantum dot, mm -hmm. and then hole transfer. You also can think that you can get 3 plus if you photo excite the dye. And then you will have electron transfer, excited electron going from the dye to the quantum dot. Mm -hmm. Then you also will get three plus. Why we don't go this way, you probably can answer. Well, so. Why we really want to excite the quantum dot? The quantum dots are going to be more stable and they're also more tunable. So we can range the exact, depending on the size of the quantum dot, range the exact the absorption energy that we're interested in. I would say the main reason is it's more photostable <laughs> comparing to the dot. So it's getting big, like you can really shine light many, many times and quantum dot. And the second reason, it's a carrier multiplication process, if, which can be utilized here, right? If we photo excite the quantum dot at the high energy levels, then like in the femtosecond range, the carrier multiplication takes place. So it means now we have pair, in from one pair, right, excited pair with high energy, we're now having two pairs of electron hole pairs, right? So which means now you can transfer two electrons. Mm -hmm almost simultaneously, or oh, not electrons, holes if you want to transfer holes. Two holes can be transferred simultaneously to ruthenium dye. And why we need two, why, why we need more carriers? How many electrons are needed to oxidize the water for the, for the oxidation, what, uh, half oxidation reaction for water? Well, you need to write the equation and balance it. Anyone remembers? Or anyone can do it on a blackboard and show how to balance the water oxidation reaction? Well, technically, you were talking about it in a general chemistry, I think, where you were talking about uh, <laughs> redox reactions, right? No? I mean, I, I remember, but <laughs> it would, yeah, it would take me a minute. Two electrons, right? Yeah. Yeah, Anyone can balance or write the equation? Four. For water oxidation. Well, water oxidation reaction, what's the problem? Well, the two you're going, yeah, H2O, so 2H2O to H2 and, uh, no, uh, 2H2 and O2. Then you have to balance it, so right. you end up and with four electrons. electrons. So to have this reaction, you need four electrons. And again, this four electrons comes due to the balancing the, balancing the equation of water, uh, water H2O going to H2 and O2. So you should lose. Four and actually, it's not adding, it's losing four electrons for the oxidation, right? And adding electrons for the, for the, for the reduction, yes. And these four electrons have to be done, actually, why for the, uh, for the oxidation of water is still kind of a challenge. Uh, there's many oxidizers unknown, which can oxidize and transfer one electron. But you need four electrons to make it efficient. And you have to have four electrons simultaneously. Not like in a step reaction, right? One and then another one and then another one. You really need to have them all together. Then it would be very efficient process. Then you can oxidize water right away, and then we can use hydrogen and oxygen as, as just compounds and uh, really use it for the, uh, how's it called, electric power, electric power plants or something like this. So if we have carrier multiplication, it already provides you more carriers simultaneously. Well, we don't still don't have four, but at least two. Two is better than one. So you probably also expect that if carrier multiplication really 
can take place in the system, then your oxidation processes will be efficient. More efficient rather than through the single electron photo excitation processes. So two reasons why. One is for the stability of the quantum dot, and second is the carrier multiplication, which is known, known for the systems, for the quantum dots. Good question. Done, or you have a set one? Oh, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, I, had, I had a question when it comes to the BDOS radius or something. I'm, I'm not too familiar with the term. Uh, what, what does it mean when you take a single point of something? Sure. So, when, so I'm going to, so when I show you this, um, so this is the entire multi dynamic trajectory. So, if I'm taking a single point, I am looking, I'm chopping just one. So time 500, this vertical slice of all of these is one single point along the 4,000 femtosecond trajectory. So all I'm doing is I'm looking at one small piece of it and just looking specifically what's happening right there. So yeah, so when I was doing um, this, I was looking at zero, I was looking at 100, 200, 300. And so each, just, each just step. yep, so instead of looking at everything in between, just solely picking, I'm just going to take a few small ones, take a look at what's happening, see what's interesting, and then go back in more detail. Okay. Yeah. So, yep, so that way, at each single point, you know, the atoms are oriented just a little bit different to one another because of the dynamics. And so how are those specific adjustments changing what we're seeing? Okay, thank you. On your plot with like all the different uh, orbital energies like plotted out through time, you have like two energy gaps there kind of between your bands. Uh, you have, he like, has three energy gaps, I would call them. Well, right? yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but like why, why are there multiple gaps there? I guess that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Sure. Um, well, so two, two main parts, I guess. So earlier we were talking about, so we have our die and we have energy levels contributed by the die. Mm -hmm. And we have our quantum dot, and we've got energy levels contributed. So depending on the, a specific die and quantum dot system, how they overlap or intertwine is going to vary. And so when you start having energy states from one portion, you know, being inside a band gap of another, like a quantum dot, you're going to start having, you know, a distribution with some of these spatially separated energies. Um, another portion of it is, once you start adding other pieces together, like a die and a quantum die, then you start to have a shift in total energy because now you have a little bit of an increase in um, columbic interaction between electrons on the die and electrons on the quantum dot, and so it shifts it just ever so slightly. Um, and so that's why you start to see just slight variations in, in states being intertwined. Okay. And can you return back to your doors, uh, like, you know, uh, single point doors? Uh, yeah, if you look, like, doesn't matter, right or left, uh, look on the unoccupied states, right? So you can see, like, these sharp peaks also. Yeah. So actually, this is your three bands. Right? So, and, so, and yeah. again, so it might be also uh, the, the uh, technically in quantum, though, due to the confinement, right, you expect the discrete levels, right? And uh, in a lumen, it's a more, most, most pronounced comparing to home, and usually we have like a, a few low state creating really kind of a gap, or how say, a band, which is, or sub-band, which is pretty much separated from the, from the rest of unoccupied states, and having kind of this sub-gap very close to, to real gap. But plus contribution of, uh, of dye, uh, dye molecules, which also have to be more discrete. So, fine, fine with effect. Okay. Yeah, and if like if I went to broaden these and just you know had vertical lines where the energy levels was, you know, it'd just be here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. It's just that the broaden just so it looks nicer. Okay. So I have a stupid question. Ooh. So <laughs> you have drastic changes in populations with what seems to be almost like adjacent time steps. In other words, it doesn't take many, many time steps for a significant change in population to be observed. Just a small change in, in time um, sees a drastic change in the population for your homo. So I assume that this is correlated to, to some geometrical degree of freedom um, in the dynamics. Do you know which portion of the geometry changes in order to make that influx in, uh, or to make that a drastic change in population, and if so, which 
which uh, degree I mean, of freedom is. So, so if we're looking at that PDOS plot, now I'm assuming this is kind of what you're referring to, just how drastic of a change there is. So in this, it's not so much that there's a dynamic driving force, but it's more the way that... The generous of the HOMO and Yeah, so the, the HOMO value that's calculated to be HOMO, where the Fermi energy is at, and then where the next state above it is, are so close together that along the trajectory, the populations fluctuate just a little bit, and so then the HOMO shifts from one to another. So the Fermi energy kind of jumps back and forth over top of um, one of the energy states. And so that's why these... All these states, um, these super high population states, shouldn't actually be there. They should be where they're at when it's at a low population. It's more an artifact of the way the population is assigned in the calculation than it is in any type of, um, you know, molecular fluctuation or, or geometric change. So can you correlate that um, drastic, or well, I guess it's, so it's not such a drastic change in the electronic structure. It's just a subtle change in it's electronic assigned. structure leads to the drastic population change. Right. But so, because, yeah, because it's assigning the, the population to a different state, whereas it should be to another one. But, right. so yeah. but this is a very important point. Yeah. Like, again, as soon as we believe that what we're getting at really physically reasonable data, right? So to check how this uh, electronic change in the trajectory, or how, say, how, how these fluctuations in the uh, electronic trajectory related to which type of changes in geometry, in other words, right. kind of normal yep. modes, right? Yep. It's, of so course, it's of course possible, and of course it's a very important question to address. Yeah, and okay. so Pung, Pung did have um, a couple plots with um, frequency values plotted for the system, and so once I can isolate you know, what the frequency of these fluctuations is, I can go back and see once if he had it assigned to a specific motion, and if not, um, then yeah, I can definitely go back and look at that. And try to assign it. Perfect. I'll ask the same question next July. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question off of Brendan's. Um, so how will the non-adiabatic dynamics uh, be affected if you have your adiabatic states change from a ligand-based state to a quantum-based, uh, quantum dot-based state during your dynamics? But this is exactly what happens. Yeah. So yes, then, but how will this affect the relaxation and all of the properties that we're interested in? Because it would change the nature of the state. Therefore, the non-adiabatic couplings would drastically change as well because of the overlap being a different place in the system. So yes. Yes. So with, with our Redfield um, method, so we look at a ground state configuration of the electronic structure and we base, well, I mean, so the coupling values are assuming that the charge is, is localized on that state. As we go from one time step to another, it's going to take the coupling between those states. So you're going to have um, a reduction in population or, or an increase, just depending on where they're spatially localized. Um, but it would be something that would be, I don't, I wouldn't say, well, unbeknownst to us unless we went back and did like these partial density of states. So I would have to look at specific coupling values between the two different sets and then do a comparison to actually know if it's increased, you know, helping or hurting the overlap and then that would, you know, affect the rates from there. So on your time-dependent Kanshum uh, plots where you just plot the energy versus time for each, yeah, this one, yeah. do you see much, uh, like, avoided crossings, or are they kind of well-defined? Well, it's, it's hard to see because they're plotted as adiabatic states. Um, with different systems, it's been easier to see if there would be um, you know, some type of, of crossing happening because it's more of a slow, pronounced type of wave almost in the fluctuation instead of being very quick. Um, so like when you're looking at, say, um, this red line, and all of a sudden it gets very close. So we would assume that these states are interacting and a transition could occur. 
Um, or it could be something that, you know, a blue state is actually this red one, and this red one is actually the blue one. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to know specifically without going back and, and imaging the electronic structure at those instances where we think there might be something happening. So do you think it would uh, speed up the relaxation, like artificially speed it up? Or do you think it would not have any dramatic influence on the relaxation? Part of because you're saying that your time is like femtosecond relaxation. So could your relaxation be due to the fact that you're changing the types of states, which then force it downwards where it would take longer to do adiabatic like the coupling between the states does that make sense yeah i mean i, th I don't i think I it's not again if you look on this uh, projected kind of information on the contribution of orbitals right you can notice probably again that the states is not just localized on a die or localized on the quantum dot this is what we see in the ground state. For the ground state, our home is completely on a quantum dot, uh, home on a die, plume on a quantum dot, 100%. Like it's 100% localized state, donor acceptor, uh, kind of you know, very clear picture. However, here, if we look on a, a percentage, it's really very much hybridized. And you really have, even in a case when we have dominating nature of quantum dot, right, you still have significant contribution of the die. And again, this is probably artifact, this hybridization of the state is probably kind of artifact of this uh, too close, uh, too digit, like you have really two states of the quantum dot and the die to be degenerate, to, which again, the, the way how the program is doing it, oh, because the degenerate state, then it's just a superposition, right? And kind of making, and superposition means hybridized state which might be not really corresponds to the nature. Moreover, if you use a different functional, your splitting between levels will be increasing. You really kind of killing down this degeneracy and you will have really 10 times difference in your dynamics because then you really will have states localized on the quantum dot, states localized on the die. And, and then they are overlap even if they switch, especially if they switch and if at some moment it's in a quantum dot, at the other moment it's in a die, then their couplings would be really very small, non the couplings because they have uh, different localization, different property. But if they hybridize, then you increase their couplings, and then they become really very quick. So, so it's, I would say, your question really has to be split into two questions. One is not just switching between die versus quantum dot right, orbitals, because, because that could go but way. also, yeah, but also whether you really see this mixing of the orbit, the hybridization between orbitals. And how really trustable this mix? Like, are we really supposed it has to be degener uh, how say hybridized, or it's really artifact of the degeneracy? Right. And and if you increase the splitting, you you have completely so with, localized there or localized there. Yeah. So very interesting question, but but this is exactly why we need to do more how say more precise uh, maybe recalculation of the things to answer these questions. Was missing. <laughs> you would, and oh, Javed has a question. Now. I have a kind of conceptual uh, questions about. You already seen that if you add a charge, is they have a significant changing and everything, like electronic structure to um, NTOs and everything. So if you apply this system for photovoltaic application, and if you see the charge transfer from the quantum dots to the die, so with the time you will get some charge accumulating in quantum dots or in dyes. So in that case, your whole properties should be changed every day. It could be changed, right? No, no you're talking about different things. I the mean, charge here, the difference in the charge which he's seen, mm -hmm. is a total charge in the system. What you are saying, your system is still neutral. When you transfer your charge from quantum dot to the die, or from the die to the quantum dot, you're not changing the charge on the overall system. You so we are separating pole and electron. So if both biases can be different, then if the electron is transferred to in other end, so you will get a whole, I mean, overall total positive charge in the in the system. Maybe it's not that. No, no, big, no, no, no. You don't want to charge your system. Now, if we transfer, if we transfer the electrons from the from the one cell to 
electro i mean oh, i don't know you, okay. i don't know the term was the i mean other so, side so yeah. i mean you're i mean now you're starting like it's non-linear it may be non-linear yeah. right he, and so then you're going to have a whole range of different properties i mean that's then you got to talk to sergey so i was like if you if you said a very big difference by adding only one electrons so it's very usual to get this kind of difference in the real application right, right? so one yeah so once you transport a charge out then you're left with another mm -hmm. system that system. has a new charge but doesn't matter doesn't matter because we need to return it back to the ground state right so to get like let's say you have one cycle you excite mm -hmm. then there is a charge transfer after the charge transfer, whatever happens, let's say your electron transfer faster than whole, mm -hmm. you still have to wait until whole is transferred, right? Because yeah. you cannot excite when the system is already charged. So it really has to go back to the ground state, and then mm -hmm. you kind of uh, photo excite it once again, and then the cycle is repeating and repeating. So you really have to get rid of all charges and get, like, get your system to be relaxed back mm -hmm. to the ground state when your second si cycle is uh, going. And the mm. question is how quickly how quickly it's, it, it's, it's happening, right? Well, so yeah, it involves. You're right. So electronic structure might be affected if your electron is moved already, and whole staying there, or staying there, or backward. Yeah. Electron is leaving longer. Your call will be disconnected. Oh, Brandon, Brandon didn't have chance to ask questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay, but I don't know. Yeah, that might even decrease the, I mean, efficiency of the cell, kind of, really. Then this is next kind of step, right? First step is just to see that you really have this charge separation and charge transfer. Mm -hmm. no, because I if mean, your charge transfer not happening efficiently, mm -hmm. then next step of where this charge is really mm -hmm. going after this uh, to be used is, is mm -hmm. kind of the next question. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't know. Moon, do you have a question? Yeah, I guess I can ask one. So I guess to my understanding, there are two problems. The first one is partial occupation. Second one is index warping. So I was wondering for the partial occupation, if you include spin or spin, non collinear spin, does it help? Well, I haven't tried that yet. So I don't know if, we're, if you want to go there, we can. But that's, no. no. Like, again, you not associate it's the spin with the ruthenium, right? Like, this charge, not really, uh, actually, whatever the number of electrons we will have, we probably still have the even number of electrons. It might be odd. Well, because, well, if it's negatively charged, it's even number of electrons. Because you're losing proton, you're not changing the number of electrons. Uh, again, if it would be, right charge which means negative charge when you deprotonate the carboxylic group so you 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 charge it due to the proton not due to the uh, change of number of electrons number of electrons stays exactly the same in the system if if you have a protonated case right so that's why if it's correctly charged then spin should not really have uh, it's, it's 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 in the even configuration of the spin and ruthenium was also with paired spin like in a low spin state so that's why spin is not really a, a problem here um, if you now uh, if we have zero charge instead of minus one means we lost one electron yeah then we have non-even electrons but again this is probably s electron from uh, 2s state on, on the oxygen probably or p electrons from the S or P electrons, probably S electrons, I don't know what is lost first, probably S electrons. Um, which again, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not really as, can I say, um, not really spin in a way how you talk about transition metals, right? Okay. So another, another question is for the index swapping. So you are going to try different functionals of different methods. I was wondering if you can just try DFT plus U to open up the gap. I mean, you could do that. Because that's, I know, from applied a scissor operator in some of these plots that he had. And so, you know, just artificially opening the gap. That's a very, would be an option. You know, it's just. Well, but again, what's the benefits? If we can work with HSE, which is proving to be really much better functional, yeah, so it's just more a pure GGA. Expensive, right? 
well, it's more expensive, but again, if it's doable, it's more um, more reasonable probably to go to more accurate methodology rather than. I mean, I, I just doubt that. Uh, uh, have you ever tried dynamics with HSU uh, with 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 a, with a plus U term? Yes. Oh, you did right. So technically, it's not a, an issue. But there are a lot of issues again for the complexes. If it would be organic molecule, it's one thing. But because we have this metal organic complex, there are several papers where people talking that your plus U will not give you the right electronic structure for metal organic complexes. We are not even talking about quantum dot or interaction between them, which might change the electronic structure. Mainly because you need to have a different U portion. You, usually, you put U portion only on the on the metals, right? But it was kind of proving that you also need to put a U portion on the P and D electrons of, of, of organic part, right. right? So, and it's actually different portions, so it's really kind of more complicated way how you have to define your U. You have to justify, probably again, use a spe absorption spectra to, to justify that your electronic levels are right for this uh, molecule, right? So, <laughs> so it looks like technically it's not so easy to assign it correctly. Unless, unless you're going to run for a very long time, mm -hmm. then it, you know, Oh, there was cool. also an issue with HSC, you it requires also much more memory. And then with old machines, like now on the CCAS, we don't have this problem at all because we have really increased memory uh, pieces. Before, with the very old clusters, we were restricted with two or 40 gigabytes, like cluster one, cluster two, whatever. So, uh, so then uh, actually we were not able to run this hybrid functions because we didn't have enough memory in the nodes. And then, yeah, then plus U would be the only option in this case. But, but for our, whatever, for our technical issue, uh, for our technical uh, opportunities here with CCAST, looks like it's also not an issue anymore. Good, we're done.